Good morning. Welcome to Harrisville Baptist Church. As always, we're so glad to see y'all on this awesome, cool uh, Sunday morning. Uh, if y'all would, y'all know what to do. Go stand, shake a hand. to worship you this morning. I uh, pray that you would uh, tune our hearts to, to be able to listen to you better and learn more about you today. I pray for those who can't be here this morning, um, whether they're sick or traveling. I um, pray that you would just uh, be with them as they or wherever they are. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Little sinner and the little girl. 
song to lead into the last song about the Holy Spirit filling this place. We've done both of these before, but this one is, um, the verse goes, Light of the world, step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made his heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. A lot of times when we say this, what we do, a lot of times it's not what we do. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. We are to be before we are to do. We are to be his before we are to do what he's called us to do. Amen. Amen. So we are to we are here to worship him, not worship the fact that we are in church, not worship the fact that we actually got up and made it, not worship the fact that any of that other stuff. We are here to worship him, worship God alone, and we are here to invite his Holy Spirit in us and to work through us, not only today, but as we go out the rest of this week. So. Here is Here I Am Doors.
God is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come for life, this place, and fill the atmosphere, your glory. Be seated. Amen. All right, Al.
Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for today, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that when we get down, Lord, when we don't understand, when we go through struggles in life, Lord, um, when we get stuck in the ruts of life, God, I pray, Lord, that we will look up and not only see the cross, Lord, but see, what, like Abe's saying just now, Lord, what you've done for us on the cross, God. It was love that nailed you to the cross, God. It was love that brought Jesus here. It was love. It was love. And we just thank you so much for that love. God, thank you so much for what, what you've done during the worship time, Lord. Be with Brother Rich. As always, God, I pray, Lord, that you hide him behind the cross. Lord, give him the words for us to hear, not only hear, Lord, but apply to our lives, Lord, so we can better serve you and we can be better Christians for you, Lord. And as a result, we'll be better brothers and sisters in Christ in this church and in our community, Lord, and in our families, God. I pray, Lord, that you just you just do what you do best, God. You, you just you love us. I pray, Lord, that we'll love you more. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. morning. Hope everybody has had a good weekend so far. Uh, My team decided to play a week zero game to start off the college football game. I wouldn't advise it. I definitely don't do it on foreign soil. Didn't go well, but that's okay. We got a lot of Mississippi State and Ole Miss fans in here. There'll be more losses to come, right, guys? We're with them together, aren't we? Sorry, that was low. That was low. But that's for all the ones who have been looking at me going, oh, poor Florida State. It's okay. It's coming. It's coming. Coming for all of us. College football season is upon us. That's an exciting time until it doesn't go our way, and then it's still an exciting time just in a different direction. But more exciting than that is that we get to come and worship our God together. That We get to be with one another in fellowship. We get to be blessed in such great ways by God moving through great musicians. Uh, So thankful for all the ones that were up here. And and man, what a great job uh, uh, that that Logan and Al, and and, uh, I'll I'll get Levi's name out in just a second. Man, we need to just call y'all the Ville again. That's what we need to do. Let's just do it that way. Uh, Anyway, what a great job that they did coming up here and leading us in a new song. I had not heard that song before, so I was really excited to uh, to get to, to sing along with them out there. Uh, so blessed to have people that are blessed with great talents that they share in our church, and so we're very thankful for that. Um, talking about ruts, it's a little short sermon series called Ruts, the, the spiritual ruts that we fall into, the things that we know are there, that we've experienced in our lives, that we've seen other people do and fall into themselves, that we constantly find ourselves being tempted to fall into, and if we're being honest with one another, we so often find, our, find ourselves falling into these ruts ourselves. Uh, and we hate it, right? We, we, hopefully we hate it. Hopefully we don't wallow in the ruts. Hopefully we don't you know, revel in the ruts. Hopefully we don't get down in those, those, you know, those well-worn things that we so quickly fall into. Uh, and, and, and hopefully we're not pleased to be there. Because a spiritual rut is not where we want to be as followers of Christ. It's not what he did on the cross was was sufficient to let us keep doing. It was to let us overcome that in him. And so we don't want to celebrate the ruts, but we have to know, we have to identify, we have to acknowledge the ruts in our lives. Last week we talked about the rut of division. Uh, and, And today we're going to talk about the rut of assumption. What does assumption mean? Well, assumption means that that we just think that we know what's going on and that we operate in that perceived knowledge of what's going on. We think that we know what's going on uh, with situations. We think that we know what's going on with issues. We think that we know what's going on with people. And we go ahead and we form judgments in our minds and we operate on those even before and often even after we know that they're true or not, right? And we continue to operate in our assumptions. And I tell you this morning that that is a spiritual rut. The spiritual rut of assumption is so very dangerous. And it's it's connected to so many different things that Christ teaches against and warns us about in our walk in following Him. Um, And and we're going to get to what He says in John chapter 7 here to some folks that are assuming a lot of things. But here's the thing about assumption. Um, and, and don't worry, I'm not going to use that cliche about what assuming does. That's for you guys to use and then ask the Lord for forgiveness later for using some of those words, right? But what I am going to tell you is, is that this, this spiritual rut of assumption is so very common. It's so common. Now, we've only got two ruts we're talking about in this short sermon series. This afternoon, this evening at 5 o'clock, when we recap this sermon series and discuss it, 
um, you're going to get a chance to, uh, to kind of come back and, and grade us on it, right? You're going to let us know about all the ruts that we missed. So be thinking about all the other ruts that we could fall into in our spirit, just talking about these two specifically in this sermon series. But the spiritual rut of assumption is so common. It's something that we all do. We all sit in situations and we say, watch what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen, right? And, and we are so often so sure in our assumptions. And here's the problem. Every once in a while, we're right. <laughs> Every once in a while, our assumptions actually go the way we assume it. And what does that do? That keeps us in the rut of assumption because then we think we know everything. And now we think that we can assume things even more. Because one time we might have got lucky or unlucky if you believe in luck. We might have called it that way and it happened that way. Not because we knew it was going to happen, because we assumed it was going to happen. We start to get ourselves puffed up and think we know more than we actually know. Listen, people can still surprise us. Is that true in your life? Y'all, if we make it to, to January, it'll be 30 years in ministry for me. Now that's, that's crazy because I'm, I'm a very young man still. Uh, but 30 years in ministry, in fact, I, I felt young until this morning when I woke up and realized we have a 21-year-old. Happy birthday, Mackenzie. Uh, 21. Man, her driver's license should not be pointing in that direction, right? 21 years old. But if we make it to January, 30 years in ministry, 30 years in ministry, and I'm going to tell you something. I've seen some stuff. <laughs> I've been through some stuff. I've got some stories that I could tell you from the first day to now all kinds of things, but you know what? And I, and I tell people all the time, I just don't know if people can surprise me. You know what happens right after I say that? People surprise me. People will still surprise you. This ever happened to you guys? I had a song in my brain Monday, and I could not figure out what song it was. You ever had that happen? Like you can hear the music. You can kind of hear muddled lyrics, but you don't know exactly what the lyrics are. It was a, it was a late 70s classic rock song, and, and, I, and I'm listening to it in my mind. In fact, I talked to some people who, you know, kind of have eclectic music taste in my life, and I was like, hey, uh, man, it's, it's, the song goes like this, and I'd kind of like mouth, the, I, it wasn't really humming, but I'd kind of make the, you know, the chorus go, and, and nobody knew what it was. And, and, and so I'm sitting in a, in a car with, with a good friend of mine, and and, and I, I hummed it for him, and he went like this. I promise you, he went, hang on, hang on. And then he told me the song. It was amazing, and it was like a miracle in my life. Now, he's a guy that's like me. He's, he's not only a Florida State fan, but he's also in this room. And sometimes Florida State fans, you don't think know a whole lot of stuff, right? Because we root for Florida State. Um, and, but, but, he, but he knew that song. He surprised me that day. And I was telling his wife about it yesterday, and she said, yeah, he hummed it for me, and I knew it too. I'm like, am I the only person who didn't know this song, right? But man, it was like a moment of great relief in my life. He is my hero, right? And now I know he got it from his wife, but that's okay. Man, he surprised me because, I mean, like immediately, I'd been working on, that was what, Thursday that he told me this? I'd been working on that, chewing on that, Googling it all week. Y'all got SoundHound or uh, Shazam on your phone? It's an app where you can push the button when the app's on, and if, you, if it's music playing anywhere, it'll tell you what the song is. Well, one of them, or maybe both of them, lets you hum into it. I can't tell you how many different ways I hummed that song into my stupid phone, and it kept looking at me going, you're an idiot. We don't have a clue what that song is, right? But he got it on the first try. People can still surprise us. And that is coupled with the truth about assumptions, and honestly, the truth about all of these spiritual ruts that we can and do fall into. And here's the thing. Spiritual ruts aren't based in truth. Spiritual ruts aren't based in truth. Division, we talked about it last week. That, root, that, 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 that spiritual rut of, of division in the body of Christ and amongst people whom God loves that, that rut of division is not based in truth. It's based in what the enemy comes and tries to do in attacking and diminishing the truth. So often we fall into it. Certainly the spiritual rut of assumption, it's not based in truth. Sometimes it's based in luck, like we talked about a minute ago. Sometimes it's based in what we like to call educated guesses, but again, educated guesses are still just guesses, aren't they? It's not based all the time 
in truth. It's based in what we think we've observed from real events and from real experience, but that's not always a predictor. You know, when, the, when you see commercials or hear commercials on the radio about things to invest in or things that might make you money, what do they tell you? What's that one of those disclaimers, kind of like all the side effects on the drug commercials? On these investment commercials, they say past performance doesn't guarantee what? Future results. Because, yeah, it did happen this way, but the truth is it doesn't mean it will always happen this way. And the same thing is true when we fall into this spiritual rut of assumption. We may have seen a lot of things. We may have seen it happen exactly, play out the way it's playing out right now. And sometimes we get lucky and we can call the next step, but so often we can't. Because so often the way we see things is based in us and not in the truth. Spiritual ruts aren't always based in truth. In fact, they're never based in truth. If they were, then they wouldn't be spiritual ruts. They'd be the spiritual highway that God has for us to travel on. In John chapter 7, Jesus has already been teaching. He's already been working miracles. He's already called his disciples, and he has people following him, and his name is getting out there. People are starting to hear about this man from Galilee. They're hearing about him throughout the region. They're especially hearing about him in Jerusalem, where the hub, where the seat of the Jewish faith is. And they're hearing this guy saying and being claimed by others to be the Messiah, the Savior that they've long awaited, and their antennas are up. In fact, their antennas are more than up. They're actually mad at this guy because he's saying these things, doing these things that they can't refute, that are they're absolutely miraculous, that are happening, and they have no answer for it, but they don't like the way he does it. They don't like the way he's talking about it because it's exposing some of their dirty laundry. It's airing out some of their issues, some of the things that they've taken advantage of in the faith and have turned to themselves. And now all of a sudden, these people are starting to come to them talking about, hey, have you heard about Jesus? Have you, talked, you, know, have you seen what Jesus did? This guy, Jesus, this guy from Nazareth, this guy that's up there in, the, in Galilee doing these things. Have you heard? And they're jealous. So they already are starting to assume a lot of things throughout what we're going to read today. You're going to see there's a, this whole story, this whole part of this part of Jesus' earthly ministry, this part of these people's lives is fraught with assumption and wrong assumption at that. Well, it came time for the festival of tabernacles or the festival of booths where the Jewish people would actually set up tents even if they had a house they'd get on the roof in the cities and make a, a, a shelter and it was to remember when God had had helped them as they traveled and he's as he led them out of Egypt through the wilderness getting to the promised land many years later how God took care of them and so they literally would set up tents and they'd worship God in remembrance of that at this festival well, a lot of times at these festivals, what would happen is the Jewish rabbis, the teachers, would take, an, take advantage of large crowds and they would teach the scriptures. They would teach the prophets. They would teach the law. They would do their religious thing. So it came time for this festival and many of the people that Jesus is with, many of his followers are going to Jerusalem from Galilee. They're going, as the Bible says, up to Jerusalem, even though they're going south because they're rising in elevation they're going to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival. And John tells us that Jesus' own brothers said, hey, come on, this will be a great time for you to show them the truth, to show who you are. But Jesus knows it's not time yet. Jesus understands His Father's will, His Father's purpose, His Father's calling, and His Father's intention in His earthly ministry. And He knows it's not time for Him to just show up and drop a bomb on Jerusalem, right? Right? He, he knows it's not time for that type of exposure. So he says, no, it's not time for me to go. So they go on. His brothers and, and some of his followers, they go on, and Jesus comes along later. He doesn't travel up um, in, in the big caravan of people. He travels on his own. That doesn't mean there was nobody around him, but he travels somewhat in secrecy. Not because Jesus is afraid, but because Jesus is working perfectly in the Father's timing. We pick up in John chapter 7, verse 14. It says, Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having been taught? Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. 
It comes from the One who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. We already see some assumptions going on here. Jesus' brothers already assumed, hey, we know what you're doing. We know, we're, we're in the know, we're related to you, we're with you. We're, you know, even his followers at this time are saying, hey, go do this, this is the next step, but Jesus knows the next step. They've been around him, they've seen him do some things, they've heard him teach some things, they've learned some things, they've witnessed some things, and they assume they know what's happening, but they have no idea. And we see that played out throughout the lives of the people that walk with Jesus, Jesus physically in his earthly ministry. They say, hey, let's do this. And Jesus says, no, 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 that's not what we're doing now. And he puts them back in line and leads them in the right way. His brothers have been assuming, right? His followers have been assuming. He gets to Jerusalem, and it said there in verse, uh, in verse 17 there, uh, excuse me, verse 14, he said, not until halfway through the festival. So Jesus is there. He got to the festival late. The festival's going on. They're all doing their thing. These rabbis are teaching things, and you know that they're teaching things that Jesus knows is not right. Why? Because they're terrible people? No, but because they've got caught up in what they know about the Word, and they don't know that what they know about God is incomplete. They think that they've got it all. And that one day, God will send this Savior, this Messiah, to show how right they are. But that's not at all what God had planned. In fact, He was sending His Messiah, His Savior, our Savior, Jesus, to point out how when we follow a bunch of rules and then even bend and twist the rules to fit and suit us, that we're always going to be not doing what God has for us to do. It's not about a list of rules that make us look good and makes other people look bad. And that's what many of these teachers, many of these Jewish people of this time and this place had been doing. They assume that they're doing the right thing, but they're far off. And they are confronted with it in the person of Jesus over and over again, and they don't respond well. In fact, up to this point, there's already people in the leadership of the Jewish faith that are planning and plotting to kill Jesus just to get him off the scene, out of the way, to not have to deal with the headache of him anymore. There's all kinds of assuming going on, but in verse 14, when he starts to teach in the festival, he, he goes to the temple courts where all of this is going on, and he starts to teach. And you know that when Jesus teaches every single time, people say, wow, we've never heard anybody teach with that type of authority. Now, this is not, this is not to say that the people that taught just taught kind of weakly or anything like that. In fact, they had some strong rabbis, some strong teachers of the law who believed in what they were saying absolutely 100% sincerely. And when they talked about it, they talked about it with what they believed was great authority. But Jesus, when he spoke, spoke from the very voice of God, and therefore it carried more weight. People were amazed by it. And so that's exactly what's happening here. But here's another assumption going on. It says in verse 15, the Jews there were amazed. And in their amazement, they are, it's also coupled with their assumption that for someone to teach this well, with this much authority, this you know, impressively, he must have studied under the best teachers. He must have had access to the most scrolls, the most accurate scrolls. He must possess an intellect and a heart and a knowledge and have a drive that no one else has. That's their assumption. We know that because they say, he, the, the, John tells us that they were amazed. And in verse 15, they asked, how did this man get such learning without having been taught? You see, their assumption is the only way you could teach with this much, you know, with this much oomph, with this much power, with this much authority, the only way you could do that was to come through their system, to come through their seminaries, so to speak, to come through and come up under a rabbi or multiple rabbis to do the thing that they understood that you had to do to get educated, and Jesus has done none of this. He's taught with rabbis even as a young boy and impressed them back then. He's not gone through the classes. 
He's not gone through their process. And they're saying, man, we know he's not educated, so how in the world can he teach this way? We are amazed by what he's saying. We're blown away by what he's saying. But there's no way anybody can do that without having, much, had, having had much education. So we must not understand what's going on because surely he's been taught somewhere. But Jesus answers their assumption and says, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Now this is going to stick in the craw of these Jewish people, these Jewish leaders and officials especially, because this is a further statement that he is who they don't want to believe he is. That he actually is the one true Savior, Messiah, the one who'd been promised and awaited for centuries at this point. The one they've been looking forward to, and they want to be sure that they're propped up by that one, not challenged and confronted and convicted by that one. And Jesus is doing the latter. Jesus is absolutely confronting them. What he says is convicting those that will allow themselves to be convicted. And he is exposing some of the sin, all of the sin, in the lives of these leaders. Jesus told him, he said, look, my teaching doesn't come from me. It's not because of look what I've learned and now I'm sharing it with you. It comes from the one who sent me. And in verse 17, he says, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. And what he's telling them is here, you keep believing what you're going to believe and you're going to think that I'm wrong the whole way through because what you believe is wrong. You keep assuming what you're assuming and you're going to think that I'm out of line because your assumptions are out of line. But he says, but if you will submit to the will of the Father, if you are actually choosing to do the will of God and not your own will, letting God do what God will do and not only what you will do and what you think is going to happen next and only what you can control, if you'll do that, you'll see, Jesus says to them, that what I'm saying is 100% true. He then goes on to say in verse 18, he says, whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. Isn't that true? When we speak out of all the things we know, all the assumptions we have, so often we do so to show ourselves to be smart or smarter than other people around us, to be experienced or more experienced than the people we're going through these things with. We do so to pump ourselves up and not always to help Glorify God in the situation. Verse 18, the second half of it says, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him, talking about God in this sense, is a man of truth and there's nothing false about him. He's saying to them, with no, uh, with no qualms, no qualifications about it, he's saying, look, you guys talk all this stuff so that it can make you look good. What I'm saying comes from the heart and the mouth of God. And it's true. You're off. Let me tell you what's right. That's a, big, that's a big claim, isn't it? That's a big thing to say. Well, of course, Jesus could say it. Because as he said, he wasn't speaking for his own glory. He was speaking for the glory of the one who sent him. And he says there's nothing false about him. He's now showing and claiming out loud in front of everybody to be sinless. And this continues to go all over him. But what we see here is, is that we must not be selfish. We must not be selfish. The whole idea of getting educated so you could talk well in front of people and convince them of how well you know is rooted in selfishness. The whole idea that they had that what they were saying propped them up in what they liked to do and what they wanted to do in a way that made them look good is rooted in selfishness. I continue to contend to you today that falling into and living in the rut, that spiritual rut of assumption, is rooted in selfishness. They're looking at who to give credit to for being so wise or who to take credit from for them being so wise. That's not what Jesus was there to do. They're assuming that, hey, this is just the way things go. This is what we do. But it is not what's right to be doing or what's right to have been done. We must not be selfish. Jesus says we don't need to talk. We don't need to live. We don't need to do. We don't need to serve for our own propping up, for our own glorification. We do these things in the will of God for His glory and His glory alone. Verse 19 continues and He says to them, Has not Moses given you the law? 
Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You're a demon possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you are all amazed. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. See, these men and the people even in the crowd that are not part of the Jewish leadership are so selfish that they're giving into and putting trust in their own assumptions that actually are not based in any truth. If there's a hint or a shred of truth that they're based in, they've long passed that and got into their own, you know, way off down the path in their direction instead of in the direction of the truth. And Jesus confronts them about this again, taking on and putting on center stage their wrongful assumption that what they're doing is the right and proper and God-honoring thing. He asks him, he says, hasn't Moses given you the law? In other words, you've got the law. You're literally called the experts in the law. You're called the scribes of the law. You copy it over and over again. You teach it. You, you have it before you. Even the people there continue to do their thing with the law. And they twist it and they turn it and they assume that that's okay just because that's what people do. Don't we still do that today, sadly? Everybody nods your head. Yes, we do. Yes, you do too. If you're not nodding right now, it's either because you've already nodded off or you're, just not, you're not willing to admit it. We still do this with God's commands. We still do this with what He's given us and what He's called us to do. And he says, hasn't he given you the law? And he, and he just simply tells them, guys, and you can't put it any more plain than this. Hey, you've got the law, but you don't follow it. He says, yet not one of you keeps the law. Does that mean that none of these people that are listening to him that he's talking to right here, does that mean that none of them are concerned at all with trying to do what the law says? Of course that's not the case. Yeah, they're trying to do it, but they twist it and they turn it and they make loopholes and they make excuses so they can do what they want to do so when they want to do it and how they want to do it. Well, that's a problem. Because when we understand about the law, if we break one part of it, we're guilty of breaking all of it. And so if we're twisting and turning just one little loophole, one little law around, we're not keeping the law as the law is intended to be kept at this time. That's why the law was never meant to save us because it's a bad system for saving. It's a great system for convicting. But it's a bad system for saving. That's why we needed a Savior. He says, hasn't Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keep it. He says, why are you trying to kill me? Now here's another assumption going on. right? Except this one is one that Jesus doesn't assume he knows, but the people assume that he's making an assumption. Didn't I tell you it was fraught with assumption? There's assumptions upon assumptions upon assumptions going on here. Jesus knows why. Because He's Jesus. Because He is God. Because He is the one that God has sent. Jesus knows precisely what these people, what these religious leaders are planning to do. And that's to kill Him. And that's fact. That's true. We've got record of this in the Gospels up to this point. It's not common knowledge amongst the people. And remember, He's talking and the people are around, and so we get kind of this mixed audience of other rabbis, but also people, lay people there in the temple courts there where he's teaching. And so he's teaching with them, and he says, look, God has given you the law through Moses, but you don't follow it. Why are you trying to kill me? And a lot of people are like, what is he talking about? We're not trying to kill you. And they even say it. They say, you're demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who's trying to kill you? Well, Jesus doesn't get into all of that specifically. He doesn't say, hey, these guys are trying to kill me. There's just not time for that, right? That's not the right thing for him according to the Father's will to do. So he doesn't do it. He could. He could have just snapped his finger and floated them all over there and took them out right there. That's not the point. He said to them, I did one miracle, and you're all amazed. He's talking about when he healed a man, made him whole physically, and just happened to do it on a day that they 
called the Sabbath. Well, they called the Sabbath the Sabbath because that's what God set it up to be, but they didn't honor it correctly. Just like you know, they're assuming that, uh, that Jesus is just assuming people are trying to kill him. No, no, what's really going on here is God has created the Sabbath, and they get all kinds of fussy about when people do things on the Sabbath they're not supposed to do, yet they take advantage of those same rules for themselves and do things they're not supposed to do. And Jesus says, look, I did one miracle. I healed one man. And you're amazed. In fact, they are, it's also that you're flabbergasted. You're, you're shocked. You're clutching your pearls. You're beside yourself that I did this miracle on the Sabbath. And he gives an example in verse 22. He says, you, you know, you have, uh, Moses gave you circumcision. He says, technically, you say Moses gave it to you. It was around before Moses, right? And then we know that to be true from the Old Testament. He says it didn't come through Moses. It came through the patriarchs. It came from God. He says, but you'll circumcise a boy on the Sabbath to keep the eighth day ritual, to keep the eighth day commandment. They would do something, even if it fell on a day when they weren't supposed to do work and there was a loophole built in there, that they could do that and it'd be okay. He says, you do this as you please in a way that makes sense to you. You assume that it's right. But he says, look, in verse 23, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath, if we can do this thing that is right but is wrong according to the time that you want to hold everybody else to, if you're operating this double standard, he says, if, you, if a boy can be Sabbath, circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Now, we could go a long time into this particular issue here, but let it suffice to say for right now that these people assume that what they were doing was right and what Jesus was doing was wrong because their assumptions weren't based in truth. They were based in selfishness. But here's what we know. Last point, we know that the Lord reveals the truth. The Lord reveals the truth. Sometimes He's already revealed it to us and we fail to see it or refuse to see it. Sometimes we don't know it fully and in our sin, in our assumptions, He will reveal it to us in His timing. But the Lord reveals the truth. Jesus says to them, you're making all of these assumptions. And He's even talking to His brothers here who had told him to go to the festival earlier, right? He's saying all this stuff to them and telling them, look, all of you guys, all of this crowd, every person that's ever breathed that's not Jesus, in our sinfulness, we fall into the rut of assumption. And we assume that what we're doing is right. And he tells us, stop that. He says in verse 24, stop judging by mere appearances but instead judge correctly. How in the world are we supposed to do that? By laying down our whole life to Jesus. Not just one time to join a church or to be baptized or to be saved, but every moment of every day. Laying our whole lives, including our assumptions, down before and in Jesus. Have you done that? The truth of Scripture today tells us that until we've done that, and if we haven't done that, we can't judge correctly. We will always, even what we think is a firm judgment, the most most educated of guesses, we'll still be guessing, we'll still be assuming, we'll still be falling into habitually that spiritual rut of assumption. Jesus says, that's not how it's supposed to be. You don't have to assume. You can simply experience and receive the truth from God and live in it. The truth from God tells us that we'll never be able to save ourselves. That when it comes time for us to give account at judgment, if we have any body's understanding or righteousness other than the righteousness that comes through Jesus by us submitting our faith or submitting our lives to Him in faith, that we will not be known by Him. That we will not be saved from eternal punishment. That we will bear the wrath of God for our sin on our own. Today, it doesn't have to be that way because He did die on the cross as the guy sung about earlier. He did go to the cross. He did rise from the grave. He did those things that we might be able to overcome them. If you've not put your faith in Jesus, then step into salvation today by putting your faith in Him. Laying down even those assumptions that you think are so right. If you've put your faith in Jesus... Don't be guilty, as so many of us so often are, and I'm right here with you with this one. 
of having lived a while, seen some things, been right about a few things, even though we didn't understand fully why, and then thinking we can assume everything about everybody, everywhere, every time, because we can't. And then when we fall into that rut of assumption as believers, we cause more trouble for the kingdom than we ever would intend. And Lord, help us if we intend to cause that harm to the kingdom. Today, if you're a believer, thank God for your salvation, but continue day by day, moment by moment, to lay down those things you assume and to trust and to follow Him. If there's something else that God's doing in your heart, Maybe it has really nothing to do with assumption, but he's just working on you as only he can. In these next few moments as we sing, as we respond in worship, not just with the song, but with saying, God, I want to do what you have called me to do. I want to surrender every part of my life to you. If there's something God is calling you to do, do it now. Do it today. Don't put it off. Don't assume you've got more time because we never know. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the truth. Lord God, we thank you that we don't have to operate, we don't have to to, uh, do and and live in falsehood. Father, yet forgive us that we choose to do that so often. Lord God, for the one here today, the ones uh, who, who may be watching at home with us, Father, Lord God, if you are working in their heart and telling them that they have not put their faith in Jesus, then let today be the day that they surrender to the one who gave his life for them. Step into faith, believing that Jesus is that one and only Savior and giving him over their lives in faith. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, once we have put our faith in Jesus, to still live in this eternal life even now as we look forward to heaven one day. Lord God, for those of us that are saved, let us not find ourselves trusting in our own assumptions, living and operating in our own assumptions, but let us live in your truth. Lord God, work as only you can. Father, help us to respond in surrender to you. We now do that very thing as we worship you still. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand.
hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, It's your breath. Father, we do love you. As we just sang, Father, you are great, Father. I pray that if uh, someone here that has never accepted you as their Lord and Savior, Father, that they do that today. Father, as Brother Richard just stated, uh, tomorrow's not promised, Father. We take that for granted. We say that lightly. But we know it's the truth, Father. Continue blessing this church. We thank you for the growth that our church is going through, Father. Bless this portion of our service. In your name we pray. Amen.
Our ministry spotlight today is to remind you that tomorrow is the day. You know what the day is? Tomorrow is the day that they begin work on our new Family Life Center gym floor. Now, this is a big thing for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, it's going to make so much more opportunity for us to use our Family Life Center for ministry. Number two, it's expensive, right? Um, and so they're going to be coming in starting tomorrow. They're going to be preparing that floor. Now, if you peek down the stairs, um, you know, midweek next week, you won't see the new floor, and yet that process takes a few, uh, several days, even going into a couple of weeks. Uh, but I want to remind you that our gym, the, the basketball part of our gym, right, that includes the stairs going down to it. They're not doing any flooring work there. But if you don't go down the stairs, you can't get to the floor, right? So it's off limits. It's closed to anybody and everybody, no matter what the reason, okay? Uh, it's closed during this process starting tomorrow and going about three weeks or so. We'll be, it, we'll be celebrating and, excited, and excitedly telling you when it's open again, and we'll have a brand new floor to go do all kinds of great things on. But for right now, we're in full-on construction mode, so please make sure that you don't go into that part of the gym, into the Family Life Center. The classrooms upstairs will still be accessible. The classrooms downstairs can still be accessible through this end of the gym, not walking through the big part of the gym itself, okay? Very important. Uh, we will only, as a church, fine you about $85,000 if you walk on the floor. <laughs> no big deal. Just scratch out the check, and we'll start the process over again. No, no. touchy. <laughs> Please don't. Help us out with that. We appreciate all the folks that have worked so hard to get that going, including uh, our Building and Grounds Committee that's been working so hard on that. Exciting times to have things going on uh, in that way in construction and getting our next chapter of our next 25 years out of our Family Life Center and ministry. Speaking of exciting things going on, Brad, Janet, come on up. Yeah. You, you know these folks. They have been worshiping with us and, and hanging out with our youth and doing great stuff here for several months now. We've been glad to have them. Uh, this is Brad and Jana Johns. If you've not met them personally, you'll get a chance to today. Uh, and so they have come and they have said that they have put their faith in Jesus. They, Brad's been a longtime minister in several different stations, several different churches, several different parts of ministry. Um, and and Jan has been right there with him as his loving wife through it all, making sure he behaves and does right. Uh, but their, their letter is, they want to transfer their letter to Harrisville Baptist Church as members from Calvary Baptist Church just down the road here in Braxton. Uh, if you're in favor of that, say amen. Amen. We are so glad to have y'all and look forward to what God's going to continue to use you to do here in this body of believers. And uh, we know that we're going to be able to glorify him together. So as we dismiss here in just a moment, if you'll come and extend that right hand of fellowship to Brad and Jana and tell them just how glad you are that they are here at Harrisville Baptist Church officially now. And we, uh, we're so thankful for both of them as well as for their family. Steve? Brother Rich. Nope. Oh, yes, ma'am. Because that's coming up in October. Yes, ma'am. October the 13th. Sure. So we just want everybody to be aware. Call your family, your friends, whatever, that you should come. And remind me of Brother Brandon Wildman, who was a youth minister here, and will be leading the service for us that day. So just want to let everybody know, get prepared for a good homecoming. We will have a potluck lunch that day. No services that night, correct? Oh, yeah. We'll give you all the schedule when we get a little closer yeah. to it. But I just wanted to remind people to get ready for it. Sue and I are excited about this. So, Sue, I'm glad you decided to do that. Everything she just said is exactly right. If you hear me say anything different, go with Sue's version of That's it. Right. Okay? Thank you, Sue. And so I thank Sue for reaching out to Brandon and uh, continuing to pray for homecoming as we get ready for that uh, in just a little over a month. Man, September's almost here. Um, all right. Steve? Amen. Y'all will please stand. I'm so glad. 